And then he says, and finally, the, the least of it is what is done out of fear of others' scornful gaze. Right? In other words, you do it. That's the least of the riya. You do it just because you don't want people to say, you know, he's a bad person or something. So he says, it is cured by knowing that had all creation joined forces to oppose you or support you, they would not be able to without his permission, Allah. Indeed, he alone possesses rewards for your actions in, in your two abodes. In other words, in dunya and akhirah, it's Allah alone. It's also cured by maintaining awareness of its harm, which results in detesting it and thus causes it to pass. That is its intellectual treatment. Its practical treatment is accomplished through veiling one's actions from the eyes of others and by reciting surah al-ikhlas often and say that istighfar. So this is a really important treatment here for everybody because this disease is a serious disease and, and we all want to be free of it. And so uh, the first one is doing things, veiling your actions. This does not mean that you should not do actions in front of people but it means that you should also, out of fear of riya, if you're able to do it uh, when people aren't there, it's better to do it that way. So if you're going to donate money, it's better not to do it in front of people. Although, the ulama say, if your intention is to encourage other people, it's a good thing. So it has to be weighed in mind. You have to look into your heart where, what you want. If you want to show off that you're the one giving the $10,000 donation or $5,000 donation, then you ha do it secretly. But if you really don't feel that, you know, you want to encourage others, something like that, then it's permissible. So you have to watch your own heart and guard it. And this is a very subtle matter. So avoiding doing things, night prayers, right? Doing night prayers where people aren't going to see you, where people aren't going to recite in the Quran, doing dhikr, uh, things like that. And even though the ulama do say that for scholars it's better to uh, do these things, uh, also where people see them to encourage them and to give them that. It's also a danger for people uh, of knowledge because they are as susceptible or often more susceptible to this disease than other people, right? Because of the nature of their position and things like that. Now the other thing is Surat al-Ikhlas. Ikhlas, if you look at the actual meaning of the word, Ikhlas comes from a word khalusa which means to be pure. And it relates to honey. Pure honey, leaven khalis, pure milk. Leaven khalis is leaven that has no, uh, it's, nothing's come into it. It's pure, right out of the udder. So it hasn't been contaminated by anything. And that's what the deen al khalis to Allah is that which is not contaminated with riya. That you worship Allah and there's no contamination of riya, of hidden shirk, of doing it for other than the Allah's sake. And the mukhlisin are the people that do that. Now if you look in the Quran, there's two uh, words that, that are used. Mukhlas and mukhlis. You can find them both in the Quran. The mukhlis is the active participle and the mukhlas is the passive which indicates there has to be two, uh, there has to be a tawfiq from Allah. It's not enough for you uh, to be sincere from yourself. There has to be a tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. And that's the secret uh, of success, is, is that Allah gives this tawfiq. And that's why Abu Hassan al-Shadri said, Allahumma ij'al sayyati sayyat al-mahboob ladayk. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ حَسَنَاتِ حَسَنَاتَ الْمَبْغُوضِ لديك. Uh, Make my bad actions the bad actions of those you love and don't make my good actions the good actions of those you hate. Right? In other words, you have to have tawfiq from Allah. And Allah promises tawfiq if you do certain things. So it goes together. If, and, and this is why if you're a mukhlis but you're a mubtadi' you're not mukhlas. If, if you're sincere in your actions, like a Christian can be absolutely sincere. They can. They can have ikhlas. Don't think they can't. You can have a sincere Christian. Really. You can have a sincere Buddhist. You can have a sincere uh, Jew. You can have a sincere uh, person in any tradition. But he's not mukhlas. Why? Because his action is not in accordance with what Allah wants. Do you understand the difference? So the mukhlis, who's also mukhlas, is when his action is sincere for solely for the sake of Allah and with that he's doing what Allah loves him to be doing not what Allah hates him to be doing alright 
So that's really important to, to recognize that difference. So Allah has commanded us to do things and given us a sharia. Ah. We have to follow and be in accordance with the sharia. Ah. If we're not, we don't get tawfiq. There's no tawfiq. It doesn't matter how sincere you are. Right? And I know Christians have a hard time with this. Right? Because the, the, the Christian focus is to say, you know, the law is not really important. The important thing is the spirit of the law. No, we say both are important. One, and that's where you get the tawfiq. The tawfiq is following the law and the spirit of the law. Because you can be following the law. You're doing exactly what Allah tells you to do, but it's not for the sake of Allah. So there's riya, ghair muwaffaq. So you're not sincere. You're not mukhlis. Even though the action is, accordant, is in accordance with what Allah has commanded you to do. So outwardly you're praying, like Allah told you, five times a day. You're paying your zakat, like Allah told you. You go on your hajj. You do all those things outwardly, everything looks good. But you're doing it for other than Allah. No tawfiq. And on the other hand, you can have inside, you're doing it sincerely and, and for God. Right? I'm doing it for God. Charity. You do it hidden. A Christian knows about it. They have these things too. They know about this, not being sincere and things like that. It's in their tradition. So there's a Christian, he's doing it, but he's not doing it in accordance with what Allah says. So you have to be with the spirit of the law, but also the letter of the law. So our deen is the middle way. The Jewish way is, to, the, you know, a focus on the law, forget the spirit of the law. The Christian way is focus on spirit of the law, forget the law. So they're both wrong. One's maghdub alayhim and the other's ba'alim. Mukhlas is a passive and mukhlis is an active. In other words, in the mukhlas, it's Allah who's making you that way. And the mukhlis, it's coming from you. So doing Surah Al-Ikhlas, the word ikhlas comes from akhlastu or akhlasa, which means literally to make pure. So the surah is the surah that makes you pure. The, the, the surah literally is the surah that makes you pure. Ikhlas will purify you. The surah itself. And that's why, and I put in the note there, that Murabt al-Hajj, Hafizullah, he, most people that come to him with diseases of the heart, he tells them ikhlas, to do a lot of ikhlas. Surah al-Ikhlas. Including waswasa, like obsessive compulsive thought. So it's, don't underestimate this. He's giving you a real... Cure here. Ikhlas is an important surah. You should say it minimum three times in the morning, three times in the evening. That's the least amount that you should say it every day. Morning three times, evening three times. It equals one third of the Quran. Right? So it's, it's, it's a great surah. I mean, they're all great, but, but it, it has a special maqam. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah. He says, uh, بِعِلْمِ أَنَّ الْخَلْقَ لَوْ تَضَافَرَ عَلَيْكَ أَوْ لَكَ أَخِي مَا قَدَرَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ وَعِنْدُهُ أُجُورِ دَارَيْكَ وَهُوَ الْقَادِرَ الْبَرُّ الشَّكُورِ بِشْعُورِهِ ضُرُّهُ فَيُكْسِبَ ذَارِكَ بُغْضَهُ وَذَا أَنْ يَذْهَبَ دَوَاءُهُ الْعِلْمِي وَسَتْرُ الْعَمَلِ عَنْ أَعْيُونَ النَّاسِ يَدَّوَاءُ الْعَمَلِ وَسُورَةُ الْإِخْلَاسِ فِي الْإِكْثَارِ مِنْهَا وَمِنْ سَيْدِ الْإِسْتِغْفَارِ so that's the second uh, uh, practice to get rid of this, is to do Sayyid al-Istighfar. And Sayyid al-Istighfar is there at the bottom. It comes from a hadith that's related on the authority of Buraydah radiallahu anhu. It's in Imam Ahmad, Abu Dawood ibn Maji ibn Hibban, and Al-Hakim. So obviously it's an important hadith. It's mentioned in a lot of them. And if you do this a lot, it will also purify you from riya. And it, the hadith, the Prophet said, whoever... When it, if he rises, if he says this, and in the evening, then if he dies in that day or in that evening, he'll enter Jannah. So that's a big uh, dua. You should do it every day, three times a day in the morning, three times a day in the evening. But preferably, I would do it also after the prayers. When you finish your prayers, it's a good dua to do, uh, in, you know, any of these times, even in sajda. And it goes, Allahumma anta rabbi, Allahumma Anta Rabbi. Oh Allah, you are my Lord. If you want me to write the phonetic, do some people want the phonetic? Alright. Allahumma anta Rabbi la ilaha illa anta kharaqtani. Wa ana abduka wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika mustata'at. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sanata abu uraka bin a'matika alayhi abu bidhanbi faghfir li fa innuhu la yaghfiru dhunuba illa anta kharaq. This is really a cure. I guarantee you, try it on yourself. This is not, he's not making this stuff up. 
This is a science. Do what he's telling you to do, and, and you'll get it. Say in, in every day, say that dua. Every uh, evening, say that dua. Do surat al-ikhlas, right? Really do it with the intention of ikhlas. Ya Allah, akhlasni li wajhik al-kareem. Do it. Say it to Allah alone in the night. Get up. Ya Allah, Allah can do that. And if you do it with sincerity, he'll do it. But, you know, if it's all just like, oh, okay, you know, and what's next? What's the next disease? You know. <laughs> I mean, this is serious stuff. <laughs> this is our lives, you know. This is, this is serious stuff. This is not, I mean, this is our life. I take this stuff really seriously because it scares me. I read this stuff. I mean, I read Imam al-Ghazali's signs of insincere preachers and sincere preachers. And I'll tell you, I saw more stuff on the insincere side. And it really frightened me. You know, you read this stuff. This is the danger of this science. You start reading it and you start seeing yourself in it. And it's, it's, it's unnerving because we're going to be taken into account for all this. Right? I mean, this is what life is about. And either we get the point or we don't. But the point is, uh, we've been given a, a, a huda. This is guidance. And we're being told. Now, another thing uh, which is a really important dua to do, right? And he doesn't mention it in here, but Sidi Ahmed Zarrukh mentions it in the Nasiha. And this is a, it's a really, it's a great dua. It's from our Prophet Sallallahu so it has to be great. But To do this three times in the morning and three times in the evening. This is prescription drugs, right? <laughs> no side effect. No, it, it has primary effect. Uh, oh Allah, Allahumma inni a'udu bika an ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu. I seek refuge in you that I should associate with you and I know it. In other words, shirk, riya. This is a dua for isti'adha min riya And the Prophet Sallallahu did this. So, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika an ushrika Ushrika bika wa ana a'lamu wa astaghfiruka min kulli and there's a riwayah mimma la a'lamu the one Sidi Ahmed Zarruq gives us. Min kulli ma wa astaghfiruka min kulli ma la a'lamu. So this says, O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you that I should make shirk with you. Ushrika, bika, wa ana a'lamu. And I know about it, which is riya. That is riya. Wa astaghfiruka, wa astaghfiruka. Min kulli ma la a'lamu. And I, and I ask forgiveness for anything that I'm not aware of. Because there's shirk that you're not even aware of. In other words, riya is very subtle and it gets more and more subtle as the, the, the more you work on yourself. Alright? So, so, and I mentioned the story, one of the sadaf used to pray for 40 years, he prayed every day in the first line, and one day he was late, and he didn't want to go in because he, he didn't want people to see him in the later lines. And he said that he realized 40 years he was just showing off. And so he repeated all of his prayers for 40 years. Now the ulama use that example just to say, you know, Sayyat al-Hasanat al-Abrar, Sayyat al-Muqarrabin. 
the good actions of righteous people are the bad actions of people that are in the presence of Allah. So it just gets finer and finer. And so I wouldn't, you know, I mean, what we really worried about is literally we're conscious of it. And we just have to ask Allah to forgive us for anything we're not conscious of. And that's what this dua is. And it's from the Prophet ﷺ. So in it is a shifa. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ We reveal in this Qur'an what is a shifa, a healing for the hearts and a rahma, right? Shifa'un لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ Right? It's a shifa for what's in the heart. The Qur'an is a shifa. وَنَشْفِي صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ And we cure. Allah says, نِشْفِي صُدُورَ وَيَشْفِي The Qur'an, وَيَشْفِي صُدُورَ قَوْمٍ مُؤْمِنِينَ and the Qur'an cures the hearts of believing people, right? So the, the heart can be cured, and this is one of the du'as. Because the Qur'an tells us to, وَمَا أَتَاكُمْ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ What the Prophet gave you, take it. So he gave us this, so it's a really good du'a to do uh, every day, at least three times a day. And then he says, and this is really, look at this. He says, لِزَمَنِ الْقَلْبِ مِنَ الرِّيَاءِ يُلْفَ دَوَاءً أَيَّمَا دَوَاءِ as for the chronically diseased heart that results from constantly showing off by doing good works, even it will find a cure in this. And what a cure. So he's letting you know this is a serious uh, treatment for this disease. All right, so people believe it and practice it, and inshallah you'll see the results of it, bi'idnillah. And then he says, أَمَّا الرِّيَّا بِسَتْرِ ذَنْبٍ أَوْ خَنَا فَوَاجِبٌ كَمَا إِبْنُ ذُكْرِ بَيَّنَا uh, there, he's saying as for hypocrisy and here riya is closer to a type of hypocrisy that relates to veiling your wrong action hiding your fault this type of riya is a riya that is wajib according to Ibn Zukri in other words if somebody says to you did you ever drink alcohol you say I never drank alcohol if somebody asks you did you ever uh, uh, steal and you made tawbah from that then you say no I never did that He's saying that that's something that's not riya. That's actually uh, uh, that that's actually really important. It's a wajib. It's not considered a lie by Sharia. And I'll tell you why. Uh, my note there is that this is in fact a type of riya if the person desires others to consider him better than he is by concealing his misdeed from them. In other words, it becomes a riya when you're doing it because you want people to think you're better than you really are. But it is an obligation to conceal one's wrongdoing, not for this reason, but so that misdeeds are not taken lightly by the community. Because you see, if, if I don't know that you've drank an alcohol, and I say, have you ever uh, had alcohol? And, and you say, yes. I say, oh, then I'm not that bad, you know. <laughs> you see, it, it kind of, it, it lessens the whole uh, enormity. Because kabira means enormity. The, the word in English language, enormity, means a great evil. It's very similar to kabira. Kabira is an enormity. You don't want to make little of enormities. You want the society to actually respect. And, and I just added in there that although, because if people freely admit their transgressions, this leads to complacency and lack of shame. And although there's an obvious hypocrisy inherent in this, it is really a type of homage that vice pays to virtue in order that virtue can act as a deterrent to the inurement of deviation in the social arena. In other words, you know, vice, in a healthy society, virtue is the norm, is the ma'ruf, and vice is the munkar. In an unhealthy society, the opposite occurs. So when you have a healthy society, vice has to pay homage to virtue by hiding itself. Do you see? So it's really, it's not a hypocrisy, it's a respect for, for virtue. And that's why the sharia is honoring it. And, and the danger, see, this is what like Freud said. Now, this is all hypocrisy, and really you're all uh, seething with sexual lusts and with desire and all these things. So just let it all come out, and you'll be healthy. And now, you know, welcome to uh, 1998, right? Seriously, where it's all, I mean, unbelievable. Newsweek, you, you, you can't really even read it now. It's... The last few issues are unbelievable. The stuff, and there's no shame. None. I mean, this guy Will, uh, writing, it's pornographic. And he's like a conservative uh, commentator for Time or Newsweek or something. And this is, there's no shame because they're no longer paying homage to virtue. They don't even have the shame to hide it all. It's all like 
the problem here is not what's, what he was doing in the, in the room. That's all fine. There's no, we all this, no big deal. The problem is he lied about it. I mean, this is really the whole, you know, so it's become all sick and perverse. And even some people are saying, well, big deal. Everybody lies about that. You know, it's not like lying about uh, something really big. But it is big. It's an enormity. How did it become such an insignificant thing? Because in this culture, in the 1960s, in most uh, cities in the United States, if an unmarried, 1960s people, if an unmarried girl got pregnant, she disappeared. She disappeared from the community. And about uh, seven or eight months later, she showed up again. And they say, oh, well, she went off, you know, to stay with her grandparents. What she did was they sent her to a place to have her baby, and then they put the baby up for adoption. She came back to the community, and nobody knew about it because there was shame. That's 1960s. You know, seriously, that's not that long ago. In 1968, a woman was kicked out of Radcliffe for living with a man in the same apartment. 1968, Radcliffe was at that time still considered a reasonably radical place. And they kicked a girl out for living. Now there's co-ed dorms. I mean, it's no, who cares? So how did it get from, it got from that by having a big deal. Who cares? Belittling it. So Islam says, no, it's better to have that hypocrisy because what it is is really it's honoring virtue. That's, and that's the important thing. It's not that there's that hypocrisy. That's seen as less harmful than what happens when it's all let it all hang out type attitude. You know, big deal. That is what's dangerous, not the hypocrisy. And this, again, is the idea in Sharia of lesser of the two evils. They're both evil. You can see that. Obviously, nobody wants to be hypocrite or tell lies or say, no, I never did something and you did it. But the point is, the Sharia is saying there's a greater evil in saying that you did it because it's going to, it's going to lessen the impact of the action when other people start saying, oh, he's doing that too? Or, oh, he did it? Oh, well, maybe it's not, you know, that bad. So instead of having that attitude, no, of course not. I would never do that. Because th there's a shock. Seriously, it's not, this is really serious stuff. And, and this is how the Muslims viewed the world, right? Is that what, there was shame, right? That's why, I mean, you're not lying to show yourself as a bad person. Right. right. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to, you know, what you're doing is you're recognizing you don't want this other person to, to, to lessen their, their, uh, their fear and their, uh, discussed in the wrong action. That, that's, that's the important thing. Well, see, even now, even Imam Junaid, and I really think this is a healthy uh, opinion, I, Imam Junaid said, if you do a wrong action and you make tawbah, forget it. Don't dwell on it. Don't, don't, ha I mean, have a fear of returning to it, but don't dwell on it. Because what that does, it results in guilt, it results in, uh, it results also in a type of despair, and it results in a feeling of self-loathing. Right? And you really shouldn't. Those aren't healthy feelings. They're not. You, if you make tawbah, astaghfirullah. And make a sincere tawbah, don't return to it, and then just forget about it, like it never happened. Right? And that, that is a... Uh -huh. Well, I mean, you're not... I mean, if, you, if somebody's in an enormity uh, like riba, that's not kufar. It is an enormity, and it's a bad one. And it shouldn't be taken lightly at all. But it doesn't take you out of the pale of Islam. You're still within the fold of Islam. It's an enormity. If you've gotten in, yourself into that situation and, and it's not easy to get out of it, right? Then you have to make toba and do whatever you have to do to get out of it. In other words, begin that process and make the toba, get out of it. Once you're out of it, you make, you know, khalas. Tatub it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And toba has to be sincere. And the, and the signs of sincerity is real remorse. You have nadama that uh, you leave it uh, immediately and you make the intention never to return to it. If you do that, khalas, that's a tawbah, and you should have a good opinion of Allah when you make tawbah. Like, oh, I'm so horrible, I'm miserable, Allah will never forgive me. No, Allah tells us not to think like that. And that's like a Christian disease. You know, a lot of Christians fall into that, that despair. Uh, it's interesting, there's a lot of complexity in Christianity. Because they, they do have that tendency, and then the other tendency, like the Baptists, the Baptists, I mean, in Baptist Christianity, you can be the most outrageous person and really completely be convinced you're saved. They, and there's a Baptists that are like that. That's why Baptist ministers, you know, it's kind of this notorious thing, the Jimmy Swaggart syndrome. 
is that they really can do these horrible things and then get back up on the pulpit and it's not a shock to Baptists. It's because like, you know, yeah, we, devil got you that time, you'll get him the next time, you know. No. Al-Islam yajubu ma qablahu. Islam is tawbah. Islam is the toba of a non-Muslim from his kufr. And that, by consensus, is accepted. When you make toba as a non-Muslim by entering Islam, by the ijma' of the ummah, all of your wrong actions are forgiven. Nothing remains. It's like the day you were born, by consensus. Whereas the toba of a, of a Muslim, uh, khilaf. In other words, if Allah wants, He can accept it. If He doesn't, He can reject it. But you should have a hope that He does, because we have rajat. But don't be absolutely certain. In other words, that'll put your fear in you from not returning to it another time. All right? Um, yeah, I think, we, inshallah, we can stop there. Yeah, um, um, I hear people say that when you take shahada that all your bad deeds and good deeds, is that correct? No, but all your, all your good deeds uh, come with you into Islam. Your bad deeds are wiped out. Yeah, but the good deeds come with you. So anything you did good before Islam, it comes with you into Islam. That's why you don't lose anything, you just gain. Uh huh. That's a really good point. Uh, we don't say that Allah brings evil, but we say that Allah, uh, that in, within the decree of Allah is good and evil. In other words, Allah has measured out good and evil. It's going to exist. But the, the hadith, the Prophet's dua of the Prophet, uh, he said, uh, all of good it comes from you and evil does not return to you. So while Allah has created a world in which He has allowed evil to exist, we don't attribute evil to Allah even though we believe that it is Allah who measured it out. In other words, Allah has given... See, evil can only exist, interestingly enough, with human being. It can't exist with, in, in the animal kingdom. It can't exist. If a lion eats a, a, a baby, it's not an evil act. There's no moral compunction there for the lion not to eat the baby, right? You cannot say the lion is an evil lion. You can't say the cobra is an evil cobra if it bit, because there's, it's just a snake. It's just doing what it's, it's created to do, right? But if a human being uh, takes a gun, and, and goes out and robs somebody of his hard-earned money and then shoots him. You know, robbing is an evil and then shooting him on top of that for no reason is, a, is another heinous evil. Now, what we say is that Allah created the human being and, and gave him the ability to choose and then measured out for him what he was going to choose. In other words, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has measured out that that person would at that point choose to do that act. And he's fully responsible for it. And Allah allowed him to do that. In other words, empowered him to do it. Because it was Allah's qudra that enabled him to, to carry out the act. And it was Allah's uh, uh, mashia, right? His, his, his uh, providence and his will that allowed that person to will what he want. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ you don't will anything except Allah wills it at the same time. If I wanted to do, like I wanted to go and, and, uh, and do something harmful to somebody over here. And I start walking, now my Mashi'ah has started. But if Allah doesn't want harm to come to that person, right, and, and the person gets a heart attack, drops dead on the way. He willed something, but Allah didn't will it. So anything that you actually do can only be done if Allah wills it as well. And that's, that is when, now, when it's called, it's tawfiq, when what you will is what Allah loves, and it's khudlan, when what you will is what Allah hates. Do you understand? So Allah is the muwaffiq and He's the khadil. But you're ultimately the one who is uh, doing the evil. We don't attribute the evil to Allah, but we admit that Allah has measured it out in the world. It's part of the qadr of Allah. Allah has allowed evil to exist in the world. It's part of His creation, exactly. Uh -huh. The consequences of our actions. We're responsible exactly. for, absolutely. Yeah, whether it's evil or good. But it's Allah's qadr 
He measured it out. In other words, he, without him creating a world in which human beings could choose good or evil, no evil could exist. So ultimately you say, had, not, had Allah not willed it, there would be no evil. But it, it doesn't return to him. We don't attribute it to him. Do you see what I mean? How do you know what? How do you know that there is Allah, like, your will and Allah's will, at that particular moment, you find to an action is there? If it's in uh, the Sharia, if it's, not, if it's not in correspondence with Sharia, then there's no tawfiq. But if what you're doing is done with ikhlas, sincerity, and it's in accordance with Allah's laws, then it's, there's tawfiq. That is tawfiq. That's what muwaffaq means. Somebody who their actions, what they will, is what Allah loves them to do. Sharia view of everything you're doing. You should. فيه النبي قد حكم. Ibn Ashir, he stops everything until he knows what the hukum of Allah is. You should never engage in anything that you don't know what Allah has willed in it, has decreed. It's haram to do anything that you don't know the hukum of Allah. And thank goodness, the vast majority of things are permissible. And there's only a small thing, group of things that are haram and you have to learn them. It's pretty simple. Oh, well, Allah, Allah didn't make the deen hard. I'm, I'm serious. The deen is not difficult. The problem is, human beings just, they don't want to do these things. Taqwa is very simple. Taqwa is four things. Taqwa is doing what Allah commanded you inwardly and outwardly. Inwardly with ikhlas, outwardly in accordance with His laws. Right? That's the first two parts. The second two parts is not doing what He told you not to do inwardly and outwardly. Leaving it not out of fear that somebody's going to see you going into the bar. Right? Out of fear of Allah. Right? That's inwardly with ikhlas. And outwardly, not doing it, whether you're alone or, or, or whatever. And that's all taqwa is. And if you have taqwa, Allah promises you every good in this world. He promises you makhraj. He promises that He'll rectify your children. He promises you He'll forgive your wrong actions. He promises you that He'll open up the, the gates of the heavens and rain and give you good agriculture. He promises you that you'll have a good life, hayat tayyiba. He promises you all these dunya things. And then He promises you otherworldly things. He promised you that He'll forgive you, that He'll enter you into paradise, that He'll put you in the company of the, 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 the Nabiyeen, the Prophet, the Siddiqeen, the righteous people, the Shuhada, the martyrs, and the Salihin. I mean, what, what a deal, what a bargain. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good thing to do. Uh, you should, it's called Ihraj. Uh, ihraj, you know, the Arabs, Ihraj is when you... You, what, huh? Yeah, it's like putting somebody in an embarrassing type, and and particularly about wrong actions, not a good thing. There, it's it's again that's muru'a, and it's also the Prophet Sallallahu said, "Min husni Islam and mar'i farkuhu ma la yani." From the good Islam, the beautiful Islam of a person is to leave what doesn't uh, concern him. It's no concern of yours what he does in 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 between him and Allah, and it's better not to know it because one. You'll think badly of I mean, Imam Madik, they asked him how old you were. He said, Ya'anik, is it any concern of yours? And he was asked about that, and he said, Look, if you tell them your age, either they'll say, Oh, I thought you were older, and so they uh, belittle you, or they say, Oh, I thought you were younger, right? So you can't win. <laughs> no, that's different, because there's a concern, right? I mean, if, you, if you're getting married, there is a concern, and age is one of the concerns of marriage. It's a perfectly valid reason for a man to be concerned about the age of a woman because there's things that relate to marriage and that and also the woman uh, with the man. That's why it's not permissible, for instance, to dye your hair. If you have gray hairs, you know, and go and dye your hair and then go to the woman and present yourself as a shab, you know. <laughs> and, and then she marries you and, and suddenly, you know, she, she starts seeing the roots, right? <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, that's a big problem. And uh, vice, that is a really major problem because uh, obviously in traditional cultures, uh, you know, people knew good people, good family from bad families. I mean, that, it was just a known. You know, in, in most Muslim cultures, a good family, you know, you just knew that they weren't doing bad stuff. Unfortunately, now that is no longer true. Good families, bad families, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of people that have fornicated, 
There's a lot of people that have uh, taken alcohol, taken drugs, taken things. And especially nowadays, you know, it's very serious because there's, there's uh, diseases that uh, relate to this. There's a lot of repercussions in that. And so uh, I, I think that, you know, there, there's a valid concern there. You know. it, well, it depends on, you know, the, the, what, what, what it relates to. I mean, I think in terms of uh, zina, uh, you know, pe- people have a right to know if they're getting into a marriage. Uh, the condition of now in in Sharia uh, uh, the ayah, the verse you know that uh, uh, an adult, uh, a fornicator can only marry a fornicator right or a, or uh, the polytheist that has to do with before toba in other words the bariya was a woman who uh, would just uh, sell herself uh, in in the marketplace and she. Uh, it was prohibited to marry somebody like that if that was their condition. If they made toba, then there's no prohibition against it. But you know that's something that people have the right, uh, I think, in relation to the, you know, the situation that we're in now. Does that make sense?